Today in Across the Fence, we're a buzz in the garden with the bounty of late summer. From peppers and onions and from squash to tomatoes, we're uncovering what's ready now, what can wait, and what else can be planted even this late in the growing season. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Gardeners are calling this summer one of the best in recent memory. And if you didn't have a garden this year, don't worry. It's the beginning of harvest time in Vermont. It's a great time to buy produce at farm stands and farmers markets. Today we're going to learn what's in season, how to prepare it, and how to keep summer going for months to come. First, let's head out into the garden where University of Vermont Extension's Leonard Perry and garden writer Kathy LaLiberté are harvesting, planning, and yes, still planting. Today we're back in Richmond at the garden of Kathy LaLiberté to see in August what's still growing and what's ready for harvest. Thanks so much, Kathy, for having us back here. You bet, Leonard. This garden looks gorgeous other times of the year, but now it looks like the peak of production. <laughs> There's a lot of food in this garden right so now. So let's uh, talk about some of the things we have here. It's starting, these, these peppers are gorgeous. Yeah, these are one of my favorite peppers to grow. It's a poblano pepper. Um, they get really, really big. I like the plants are, are big and really hefty. These aren't steak. They just stand up really straight wow. and strong and uh, have these huge, huge peppers. Um, really meaty. They have to be delicious. big and sturdy to hold up they those do, peppers. They do. They're kind of hot. I don't like the hot peppers. I like more of the sweet ones. It looks like that's what those orange ones are. Yeah, that's a variety called Oranos, um, and they're super sweet, and few of them make it into the house. I just eat them right Well, in the they're garden. just gorgeous. It's an ornamental, too. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, beside us, something we haven't, haven't seen before, and it's shade cloth over some, looks like some lettuce and greens. Yep. Tell us about that. Um, well, I use a lot of shade cloth, especially for um, Resowing plants in the summertime. So under here I have um, fall crops of arugula and lettuce, um, cilantro, some other stuff like that. And so the shade cloth keeps the soil temperature down so it's not so hot. It also holds moisture. Um, so, th so things can germinate more easily. I don't have to water every day. And um, this year it's protecting them from rabbits. That's a great idea. And another idea I don't think we've seen before is it looks like squash growing up on a yep. trellis. I trellis this, that squash. It's an Italian squash. Um, it has a really long neck um, and a big bulb on the bottom. And the neck is long. And the nice thing about that is that you can um, slice it. There's no seeds inside. Wow. But they're very heavy, like probably as heavy as a baseball bat when they get mature and I use these little tomato clips to clip them up there and keep them high and it saves a lot of space. I also think it save it helps with the um, I haven't had any squash vine borer problems this year hmm. and maybe having them up might help with that I don't know. Before we talked about leeks and the potential new problem the leek moth but you've got a beautiful well, before you had a beautiful set of onions <laughs> coming along I understand you've had a problem. Yeah with just uh, probably 10 days ago they were you know, ready for the state fair. But now they have what I think is um, powdery mildew, which is uh, made the foliage, it's kind of gray and um, melted looking. But I'm leaving them there because I don't think it's gonna affect the bulbs. And I have been using the bulbs in the kitchen. Um, they're, they seem to be fine. And as the bulbs, uh, as the tops crash over, which means that they're ready to be pulled, um, I am pulling them. But I'm gonna let the ones that are still upright I'm just going to wait. So even if people have onions without that problem, they should wait until the tops start falling over, and that's a sign to harvest Yeah, them. unless you need it in the kitchen, then you should just take it right away. that's a good point, too. A lot of this <laughs> stuff, you don't, there isn't a golden moment. You have to wait till. That's if you right. want some onions, harvest them. You want some peppers. Like, Absolutely. You know, if they're not colored yet, and ours usually don't get colored because we're eager You're for peppers. Them? and we. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting, speaking of some of these things, I brought some in my garden along today to oh, show. Oh, good. So let's take a look All at right. that. Well, here's some of the garlic I harvested, Kathy. These are uh, we harvested when the top started dying back, like you want to do with garlic. And then we uh, put it in a warm, well-ventilated place to dry. Um, and I noticed you've got some, too. Yeah, I, I harvested these about two weeks ago, and we have them hanging in the barn. So they're not quite as, as dry and pale as yours, but they, they will be soon. So once these green areas start to get more yep. uh, white like this, they're dry. And then it's the time to clean them up. So what you want to do is cut the roots off there on the bottom and then 
cut the tops off pretty much just above the bulb, maybe about half an inch or so. And then you can, uh, if there's any dirt, um, loose things like that, you can clean it off to clean them up a bit. And then you have garlic ready to store again. Non-freezing, I found. They don't like freezing. But uh, <laughs> right. uh, there's a nice uh, clove there. So that's the garlic. And next to me here are some lettuce. Now this is a variety I love. It's a red romaine called Outregius. Funny name. Um, but then you notice I've got another box coming along with some seedlings that will, it's amazing to think those will look like this in a few weeks. Yeah. So you, again, a succession uh, to have something coming for fall. And then over the right, uh, late summer is a good time to pot up some herbs to bring indoors on a sunny windowsill. Uh, these are some that are wise grown. The tall one is a basil, basil perpetua. It's a great upright one. Um, it stays that nice shape. It's pretty variegated too. And then in front is a thyme. It's regular cooking thyme and then a hot and spicy oregano. So just some examples of herbs if you have limited space or uh, outdoors even, they're great to use. Earlier in the season we showed some potatoes sowing. I love these grow bags. Um, love growing potatoes in them. You can, uh, grow bags are great if you don't have a great soil, if it's not well drained, if it's too wet, or if you're limited on space. So we sowed some potatoes. These, you see, are dying back. Mm. That's a sign they're ready to harvest. So we'll kind of dump it out. This is the one called Yukon Gold. Another thing, they're pretty nice, easy to harvest. You just kind of dump it out. Whoops, here comes one. All right. So you see you got some potatoes and you just kind of pull them out. And you oh, see some really beautiful. nice beautiful potatoes. You don't maybe get as many as you do in the ground, but it, it's just a lot of fun. You get different sizes, so it's great. just a good way to grow those. I have and sweet potatoes growing in mine. They'll be ready. Probably I'm going to leave them until almost frost. Okay, yeah. so a long time. Yeah, so it works. Well, that's the other thing about these grow bags. They're above ground, so they stay warmer mm. than if the roots were in the ground. So I find the plants grow better. Yeah. And this year I tried tomatoes, and they love that. In mm. fact, I tried a new variety, which I'll try again, called Baby Boomer. It's supposed to have about 300 uh, tomatoes on the plant. Mine must have that. It's just covered. Wow. I actually brought a few here, so you can def definitely try All some right. of those here. Kind of like an oversized cherry tomato. They're just gorgeous. Mm. Um, Super aren't those sweet. great? Yeah, really very good. sweet and just so many of them. Well, let's get these tomatoes back to the studio and see what we can make in the kitchen. Okay. Well, Leonard and Kathy have come in from the garden to join us in the studio. Welcome. Let's start with tomatoes. What have you brought here? Well, I picked these tomatoes this morning. I have some bromas and some cherry tomatoes. I have a lot of those. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things I like to do with, with tomatoes is roast them. Because I find that in Vermont, um, tomatoes don't get quite as sweet as I like them. So what I do is I cut them in half. I've got some cherries and some romas here cut in half. Put them in a baking dish. Pour some olive oil on top and salt and pepper. Put them in about a 375 degree oven mm -hmm. for about 45 minutes and they get a little bit caramelized and when they come out you can either put them in the food processor which I do sometimes but because these have a lot of skins I find that that gets a little bit skinny you know <laughs> tasting <I don't> yeah. <laughs> so I put it through um, a, a kind of a food mill food press and out comes the thickest sweetest sauce you ever want to have no kidding and no skins and no seeds terrific what about drying them um, I have dried tomatoes. Um, usually I dry, the main thing I do with um, drying is herbs. Mm -hmm. And I brought some herbs today that I picked this morning. Um, I've got thyme and uh, lemon basil and sage. And some of those I do in the dehydrator. Um, the ones with thick leaves like sage and, um, and basil, um, they don't dry very well just out in the air. They tend to turn brown and take a while to dry, lose their color. So those are good to do in the dehydrator. You can run, it, it's very low heat and you run it for about 12 hours or so. Mm -hmm. um, other herbs like thyme, you can just lay out on a sheet of newspaper and they'll dry and then you can kind of crumble them up and put them in jars and they'll last certainly well past the next harvest season. Excellent. And how about tomatoes for you? Little. Well, I love tomatoes, mm -hmm. and um, I've got a bigger version of Kathy's <laughs> <You do. laughs> uh, food strainer here. Um, sometimes it goes by the name of Squeezo, and what I like to do is it, just so simple. I love simplicity. And so what you do is you um, cut up the tomatoes into uh, just sections, core them, put them in the top, and then push them down with this as you turn the crank. And the nice thing is, the uh, what little pulp there is, it's amazing how little there is, and skins comes out this end, and the juice comes out the front. 
course you want bowls under these, mm -hmm. and it's amazing how much you get. Now, it's kind of watery um, to use for like a sauce, so what I use is this medium sized strainer, and basically about 50% or so comes off. Um, it leaves some nice uh, thicker sauce in here, which I've frozen in this container, and then um, here we have some juice here. So I've got about four quarts out of uh, half um, bushel. I got about four quarts of the juice and three of the sauce. And you can make the sauce up now with all kinds of ingredients or you can um, just freeze it like I've done and then have it for winter mm -hmm. uh, to make all kinds of things with. And I understand you have a recipe too? Yeah, so what uh, one thing you can do with this now, which I like to do, is make a gazpacho soup, which is a soup, um, a good summery soup. It's a cold soup, typical mm -hmm. to southern uh, Spain. <clears throat> and the base is uh, tomato uh, juice, so basically a quart of that. And then in a, some of those other good vegetables, in a uh, food uh, processor that chops it up fairly fine, but you don't want it too fine. Um, we have a cucumber, uh, two bell peppers, and a large sized tomato or a couple smaller ones. And so you basically add all that in a bowl. You add three cloves of garlic, mm -hmm. if you like garlic, some of that good garlic we just <laughs> saw, which we love. Um, then you add a quarter cup of olive oil, good olive oil, and white wine vinegar. And then you can add other ingredients if you want to taste. Uh, you just mix it all up, chill it a bit, and you have soup. Terrific. Very simple. Let's move on to pickles, because a lot of people are kind of intimidated by the pickling process. True, true. Um, you can make two types of pickles. You can make refrigerator pickles, or you can can your pickles. And I have brought some um, sweet pea pickles that I, that I keep in the refrigerator, which I, but I don't have enough room for all the pickles that I eat all year round. So <laughs> I do need to, I, I, I save that space for the, the um, peas. And the others I can, and I have some sweet pickles, and I have um, a couple other kinds there. So the process is really pretty easy. Um, to make um, bread and butter pickles, which is what I usually make, you can use either a um, pickling cuke or you can use regular cukes and you can cut them up um, into rounds. That's for, at least for bread and butter pickles, that's what you do. And you'll make a brine in a pot, which is usually a mix of vinegar and spices and things like that. Bring that up to temperature. Um, you'll be, while you're doing that, you wanna be salting these. So you'll, you'll cut them up, you put some salt on the top and let them sit for about 12 hours. Pour off the, the liquid, and then you're gonna, when the brine is hot, put the, the cut up pickles into it. Um, and you usually boil it for about five or 10 minutes or mm -hmm. so. Then you are also heating up your pan of water, your canner, and um, then you're gonna use a canning funnel. When these are cooked, you put, you put the pickles into the jars. You can use either wide mouth or narrow mouth, whatever you like. Um, fill it up with the pickles, um, and then you're going to put a jar lid on top. Usually when you buy a dozen jars, they come with the lids and everything on them. Mm -hmm. Wipe the top clean, put the top on like that. That's full of pickles, hot. And you're gonna use a canning lid, canning jar thing like this. When this water is boiling, you lift it up, you put it into the canner, and usually you can them for five, 10 minutes, something like that. Mm -hmm. When the time's done, you want a good rolling boil, take it out, and you have your pickles. You can keep them on the shelf for a year. You don't have to do anything. Terrific. All right, let's talk about freezing vegetables, because you say you should blanch them first. <laughs> right, uh, freezing is one thing I like. It's, uh, I find it much simpler than uh, canning a lot of people do, which it really gets kind of involved when mm -hmm. you get into vegetables to keep the uh, um, bacteria and such down. But one of the things you want to do before you freeze, most things, peppers and onions are exception. You can just cut them up and freeze them. So you want to blanch. And that's basically like pre-cooking in mm -hmm. boiling water. So um, what I do, I love this time of year to do corn. Uh, so I get whole ears of corn, basically cook them average year for about eight minutes, and then take it out. You want to cool it right away in some really cold water, maybe put a little ice in that, and then cut it off, put it in a bag, and then it's ready to freeze. What I like to do with things like this is actually freeze it on a cookie sheet first uh, so it doesn't all clump together, oh, good and then yeah. put it in a bag so it's loose, and this is ready to go for uh, eating this year. For most things like um, that are kind of separate, like beans, you want to wash them, cut them up. Then what you do is put them in either a blanching pot. You can get those. What I like, it's this mesh bag. You can buy these at homebrew supply stores. <laughs> they use them for malt, but you can actually uh, just put the vegetables in that, put that down in the water for about three minutes or so uh, for a lot of vegetables. Um, and then you take it out, again, cool it. Um, then you can put it right in the bag and freeze it. Excellent. Now, I understand, too, folks 
want more information about some of these different techniques, they can go to your website? Exactly. I've got an article on my website uh, all about freezing vegetables. gives the times to do that and, again, walks through the process. And we and encourage uh, yeah. everybody to take advantage of this time of year because of the bounty. Yeah, this is a great time of the year to get that fresh produce. You'll really be thankful come this winter when you're eating all this fresh stuff. Well, I want to thank you both for coming in and bringing these uh, great, beautiful produce to show us. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. We'll see you again next time on Across the Fence. Thank you.